Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same for you as the coach. You've got to have those fundamentals. You've got to have that base to work from before you can be creative. Yes, you can employ you know, another coach from another area or somebody that's uh, described as a Luddite as far as coaching is concerned, and they could contribute so much. But that will only work so far. And then the novelty or whatever they've got to contribute wears off. So, yes, you do have to have that fundamental base. There's no doubt about that. The question is, you know, how much do we rely on the fundamentals and the rudiments and, you know, things like change. Um, Thank you. They expect a certain sort of behaviour. Yeah. They expect you to give them a bollocking at half time if they've had lots of errors or gone offside or whatever. Yeah. And then you start just posing a few questions at them and speaking very softly, and they think, has the guy had a stroke or something? It's like, what's going on here? It's, yeah. That, that requires quite a bit of changing in thinking and behaviour as far as they're concerned. Absolutely. Yep. But you can be creative in the way you do that too, can't you? Yeah. So, so one of the first things you need as far as you know, trying to sort of employ or take on board or annex the whole idea of creativity is obviously you've got to, you've got to be able to think, uh, maybe think differently. So, you know, Albert Einstein was, you know, one of those people in terms of, you know, he was one of the chosen ones that, you know, dared to think differently and obviously we got the results of that. Uh, but there's lots of people out there that we know that you know, they do think differently. They do things, they see things differently, um, and we're all the better for that. And that's why we have, you know, inventors out there that come up with amazing ideas, etc. They have those, um, those abilities to actually apply all sorts of very esoteric and tangential sort of things that they bring on board um, that normally most of us, you know, wouldn't do. Um, and of course we get the other side of it where there's lots of people who only think like that and they don't think about you know, the hard and cold facts, you know, some of the things that you do have to do. That's why I could never do physics. Um, I just wanted to employ whatever th formula came into my head at the time and <laughs> usually it was the wrong one. So I got invited back to redo physics stage one. <laughs> then they gave up. <laughs> So, you know, some of the sorts of things that we talk about when we're, when we're dealing with that, it's like, well, what do we mean by in, in intellectual capacities? What are some of those things that we take on board? Um, and, you know, these are some of the things. So, you know, I, I like to work in, in metaphors. You know, that's why we started today with, with Beethoven, uh, because sometimes I think people can, you know, make those connections. And what you want to do is get people to connect, connect with ideas or principles or concepts. And it's a case of, well, what sort of bunny can I pull out of the hat to help people connect with what it is that I want to talk about? And if it's something as fluffy as the art of coaching, then maybe I've got to apply something that's reasonably fluffy to help get that message across. Uh, so in this case, it might be thinking in metaphors in terms of the connection between um, conducting an orchestra and coaching uh, a team or a group of individuals. Um, but yeah, we've talked about decision making, so you know, <laughs> uh, the really important thing there is that flexibility. Um, sometimes it does require the logical. We do have to think logically about things. You know, you've got to be quite analytical. The question is, once you've been analytical about what it is that you've seen is going on, is your response to that going to be creative? Or are you going to come up with a very predictable response? Because uh, sometimes when people think that, you know, you've got something that's quite unique and different and unusual, um, then you can get them to buy into it. That's why we have used car sales people and insurance sellers and all sorts of people over there that, you know, they can sell the stuff uh, because that's their pattern, that's the way that they can work. 
and of course, yes, they have some some uh, some personal characteristics. Um, we know coaching's an emotional practice, don't we? I mean, how many emotions do you go through <laughs> over the course of a week as far as your coaching is concerned? Forget about life. Uh, just think about coaching, which maybe that's one and the same. But um, the really important thing is that yeah, there are an enormous number, there's a real gambit of emotions that we've got to actually think about. And there are, are there other things that are actually part of your life that you can bring into your coaching uh, and the way you do your, the, the work that you do with your players, etc. Um, and are you happy with uncertainty or ambiguity in terms of not necessarily being sure of the answer? Are you happy to be sitting in an environment like, you know, in a team talk when you're not really sure what the problem is? Um, or does that, you know, frustrate the hell out of you? Because uh, you haven't been able to put your finger on the button in terms of what's going on. Uh, there's a whole series of things that we, we have to try and to take into consideration. But a lot of the time we know that it's because uh, coaches want to be successful and effective. And so whatever it takes, they'll take it on board. What sort of social arrangements do we have with our players? Right. How much do we actually worry about our players as people? So, another one of my heroes, many of you will know this, in terms of the person, or his work. So who's heard of John Wooden? So John Wooden passed away last year at the age of 99. Uh, he coached UCLA basketball team. He won 13 UC uh, NCAA titles. He put more players drafted into the NBA than any other basketball coach uh, in the history of NCAA. Um, he never, ever spoke about winning. He usually didn't know who the opposition was, other than the fact that they had to go to a particular city to play uh, their game, etc. It just didn't worry him. Uh, he had a particular way of doing things. And he started coaching in the 1950s. Um, and then by the 1970s, uh, he was winning all these titles uh, at UCLA. And he coached the Bruins, I think, se uh, six or seven years, I can't remember which, in a row. And over the course of that time, he built up a philosophy. And he decided that the best thing that he could do was to know his players or try and define what he wanted his players to be before they were basketballers. So it was build them as people, good people, before he had good basketballers. Now the strange thing about that pyramid is that it's almost got nothing to do with sport or nothing to do with basketball. Okay, so the base of the pyramid, the strength of that pyramid along the bottom well, what do you notice about it? There's nothing physical. There's nothing physical there, correct. Rather than physical, what is it? Emotional. It's emotional, it's social, it's affective. Anything else? Yeah, exactly. And it's all about personal qualities, isn't it? So you want, for instance, a person to be cooperative. Particularly if you're in basketball, you, you know, it's, it's a team game. So if you can't build cooperativeness amongst your players, then how, you know, in terms of you know, their lives, how on earth can you expect them to be cooperative in the game? Um, I don't know how many books John Wooden read. I've got four or five of his books. But if you ever want to you know, go into coaching uh, and look at things from a slightly different perspective, I would commend Wooden's books to you. Um, it's really quite fascinating what he did and how he did it. And a lot of the things that he did was pretty much the start of what we've now referred to as humanistic coaching. Right? It was basically building athletes up as people. Um, and obviously, if you built that part of it up, you built the player would come along as well. 
uh, but the first thing was you had to create good people. And so, you know, if, if you were, for instance, three minutes late to a practice, you just weren't allowed into the practice, no matter what, you know, because as far as he was concerned, that was one of his expectations. He expected every player to be there half an hour before practice started. So when he walked into the gym, they were ready to go. You know, that was an expectation, and he had a whole series of those. Whether or not we agree with that is a different matter, but everybody understood what it was all about. The laces, correct. Yep, because he wanted it done in a certain way. Yep. <laughs> call it micromanagement, call it what you like, you know. They knew right from the get-go what he was about uh, and how things were going to be done. Yeah. So, you know, he had particular social arrangements with his players. But one of the things we knew was that, you know, um, he got to know every player, yeah. like to really know them. Um, and people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who went through his program, you know, remained really close friends with him you know, the, from the day they left the college, from that university. Um, and many of them obviously um, did eulogies at his funeral. Uh, in terms of not so much about basketball, hardly any of them ever talked about basketball. It was about what he did as a coach uh, for them, in terms of how he developed them. Now the, the question is, you know, do we worry about that sort of stuff? Do we take it on board? Have we got time? Um, is it, you know, the state that, you know, you're dealing with adults and they're beyond repair or whatever? Uh, that's irrelevant. The crucial thing is that, you know, if we were asking you to build up a pyramid, what would your pyramid be based on? And what would you uh, focus your attention on? And what would you put on each level, etc.? And how would you connect the levels, yada, yada, yada? So there's a lot of things like that that, as coaches, we do have to take into consideration. We go back to that triad, you know, the player is part of that triad, it's part of that pyramid, whether we like it or not. Uh, you know, they're there. Uh, they, they are part of it. Um, we can facilitate learning with them as much as we like, but it's going to be the player that actually controls learning. If they don't want to learn, there's nothing we can do about that, is there? The learner controls learning. All right? And do we have any creative agendas? You know, is it going to be part of what, what we want to do as far as what we set out right from the beginning of the season, etc.? Um, or maybe it's just something that happens serendipitously. Uh, really hard to know sometimes. But if we've got a creative agenda and if there's a culture of creativity in the environment and we foster that, whew, what would it look like? What good would it do? How would our opposition, for instance, respond to that? if we built it into what it was that we did. Even from, you know, going out onto the court or onto the field, the way that we conduct our warm-up. Or whether we even bother doing our warm-up, maybe we do something else. Uh, if we've got that built into the agenda, what are we therefore creating? Uh, and how do we deal with the struggles? And, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of those, are there? What's going on in your personal life? What's going on in your players' lives? What's happening in your sport? You know, the fact that they're restructuring and they're creating five new positions and three people are, I don't know whether they're going to be turning up next month or not. You know, it's just like, whew, how do you deal with all those struggles? You know, how do you deal with the fact that you know somebody's watching you as the coach uh, with an eye to asking you to look after a representative group or whatever? Do you worry about the outcome of it or do you worry about the coaching process in terms of you know being effective so many things like that that we have to factor into the struggles right. and each and every one of you have got your own style haven't you the way that you react with your players and the way that you treat your players and the way that you look at what it is that you're coaching as far as your sport is concerned uh, the way that you program things over the course of the season etc those things are all part of the, <laughs> the the patchwork that makes it um, such a big challenge for us all. So, affect, going back to the pyramid here. If we look at a lot of the affect of things, like friendship, loyalty, enthusiasm, initiative, inertness, all, right, all those things are affective, aren't they? 
they're to do with um, the emotions, they're to do with that sort of other side, you know, beyond the rational. So a lot of the thinking that we have to do is, a, is, is rational, and a lot of it is to do with the emotions. But we know, because we've already uh, heard in the discussion this morning people talking about emotional intelligence, but we also know that you know, there are a lot of other aspects to what this thing is called emotions. So dealing with the emotions of your players, as well as your own, are a big part of it, isn't it? What we've got to try and do, however, is channel uh, the affective side through positive emotion, whatever that might mean. So um, there's a chap by the name of Thompson in the States, I can't remember his first name, who started a, uh, a regime called Positive Coaching. Um, and many people liked it, and many people thought it was just too much Hare Krishna, hash pipe, peace, love, dove, groovy, wild, honey, child, let's all be a hippie and hug a tree type things. Um, it just didn't, it didn't fly, uh, because people just thought it was a way way too far down the other, other end of the scale uh, as far as you know, the way we treated our athletes, um, you know, the cotton wool thing. So it's always hard, but at the same time, it's something that we have to be very aware of. Right. But I'm sure you're very aware of how prevalent emotions are in coaching, how much it factors into what you do and how you do it. It is, it is really at the epicentre, isn't it? So what are the, some of the emotions that end up in the heart of instruction, in the heart of coaching? Frustration. Frustration. Oh, so there's just one. It's not, it's not looking good. <laughs> Sorry, you. For the coach. For the coach. Come on, what else other than frustration? Amy Jean? Pride, joy. Pride, joy, good. Keep coming. Achievement. Yeah. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Sadness. Sadness, yeah, absolutely. Absolute. Being gutted because you just, <laughs> you just lost the final by a point or whatever, yeah. Relation. Yep. Anger. Boredom? Do you get bored? Honestly? Do you get intolerant? Hell, I do. <laughs> oh, I, I did. Um, it's an enormous part of it, isn't it? Uh, we just got to, we've got to, we've got to acknowledge the fact that you know they're there. That's part of that's part of what the process is all about. It's not something that we wrap in co cotton wool or paint in purely a positive light. However, uh, we know that yeah, wherever possible. And again, I go back to the. Um, the wooden idea was that um, a lot of the time Wooden would basically set up his practices and his games uh, with this notion of enthusiasm. So there would be goals for the team, there would be goals for individuals in terms of what they were going to try and do each and every game. And all the way through it was like you know lifting the bar, trying to be better, trying to be better. Um, and we hear teams now talk about this whole notion about we're not worried about the opposition, we've got no control over how they behave or what they do, but we have got control over how we behave, etc. Um, I mean, that was a, a wooden, woodenism for many, many years ago. Um, but obviously this is the one that we really want to push, isn't it? Now, in a professional or a semi-professional environment, do we lose sight of fun because there's too much at stake? <laughs> No, it can still be there. It's always interesting when they have the, on TV, they show a little bit of the All Blacks. It's always when they're in their warm ups, I think. That's all they're allowed to, mind you. Yeah, yeah. and it's always little games and, you know, little fun games. All yeah. Fun. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, we never see the hard out, hard out. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it?
But yeah, making sure that we try and actually build that into it, that's important. Because if, I mean, if something's not fun, then you're not enjoying it, then you probably want to be somewhere else. Uh, and let's face it, there's plenty of choices, isn't there? I mean, where would you rather be now? Watching the replay, having a doze on the couch, packing of kettles, hot cup of coffee, maybe, maybe not. All right. So if we can, we have to uh, acknowledge the fact that, yeah, coaching's an emotional practice. So much of coaching is based on the emotions. All right? And there's nothing objective about that. So, you know, you can have a, a cadre of players and one day they're here and the next day they're here. Or even one individual. You know? They ebb and flow, don't they? A huge amount. And again, you have to be able to pick that stuff up. So it comes down to, again, you having to read that stuff. Looking at your players and thinking, you know, where is she or he today? And how is that going to affect what, what I uh, give them or how I deal with them or how I communicate with them, etc.? It is a very much an emotional practice. And to actually in, you know, thrive in that environment, you have to be able to understand emotions. And this is where our emotional intelligence comes in. All right? But at the same time, you have to give a huge amount to it as far as your own emotions is concerned. I mean, you think about some of the coaches that you've watched you know, in awe of and how emotional they are, how much they actually give to it. You know? And you think at the end, how can they stand up? They're just so um, effusing emotion. You know, they just seem to put their heart and soul into it. I mean, I used to have a lecturer like that. that you know, he, he would walk out the end of it. and I mean, he'd only been doing what I've been doing, standing and talking, but sweat would be dripping off and he'd walk out and it was just like, you could see it just come off him. It was just, oh. it was just absolutely knackered. Um, but incredibly, incredibly strong as far as, you know, the emotion of that time would just go, woo. Um, and he just put so much into it. And we've got coaches out there that do that, haven't we? You can probably think of examples. You're probably one yourself, perhaps. But it does require an enormous amount of um, giving, of labour. Uh, it's a big part of the whole process. And why do we do that? Is that the reason why a lot of you are here today, as far as you know, your commitment to coaching is concerned? Because you do enjoy, you know, maybe you thrive, you feed off the emotional side of it. Maybe it's, that's the thing that we're just not sure of because it's just so unpredictable. Okay. Oh, finish the bullet, you fathead. There we go. So it's not just a technical thing. All right. There is this other side to it. So there's this left, I can never get to remember which is which, left brain, isn't it? There's a the left brain side, um, which is dealing with all the subjective stuff and the, the arty stuff, etc. I can never remember if it's left or right. I think it's left. Is it? So it's right brain. Right brain's the creative. I'm just thankful I've got one. <laughs> it's more important than politics. <laughs> yeah. So, um, C. Wright Mills, 1959. There's not many of us in the room that were born before then. But, um, but I think for a lot of us, that's what it ends up being. That's how it ends up happening. All right we're pretty much thinking on our feet uh, because a lot of what goes on in the coaching environment, we actually, that's what we have to do, isn't it? You have to deal with what's basically thrown up to you, what actually comes out. Uh, I think it's a great, um, great term. Now, um, I'm trying to remember... Gwyn, it's Gwyn Jones? Gwyn Jones, I think it is, in Wales. Most of the material that's been researched in coaching um, in recent times has come out of Wales. Um, and I think it's Gwyn Jones. I should be able to remember, but I can't. Um, 
done a huge amount. Lots of the books and the uh, periodical uh, material has got the name Jones on it. Uh, and some of the things that I just wanted to highlight that he talks about, for instance, is that, yeah, we still are trying to come to grips with what all of this stuff means, what coaching is actually all about. So for a lot of folks, yes, it's ill-defined. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because if we were able to define it, then it would be a piece of cake and we'd probably move on to something else. So it's trying to actually come to grips with meaning, you know, what does coaching actually mean? Well, you could probably sit down for a year and write a book about that, couldn't you? Uh, and it would be totally different to the person on either side of you. And that's one of the things that makes it, you know, really quite exciting. Um, but we also know from <laughs> a lot of the research that's been done out there is that what we're doing here today is not very helpful right? because a lot of the time coaching programs um, have got a very limited, if any, impact because a lot of the time we're dealing with these theoretical concepts and ideas and angles and components, etc. But then when you get to your own world, how applicable are they? Or how much can you actually subscribe to the things that you've been doing here today or in previous sessions, etc.? Right. Some of the things that you can apply or you can adapt or you can rejig, so to speak, but to actually employ them holus bolus or take the template as is into your coaching world, we know that it just doesn't work because your environments are so different, so unique. Yeah. Yep. Scary thought, isn't it? And then you look within that time, time frame, actually, how much of that was effective um, and how much of it was mindless or redundant as far as learning goes. <sighs> so. Um, Another one of the, the, the theories out there, or well, a lot of the thinking that's going on, is that um, coach, coaching is based on tacit knowledge. So, what do you think they mean by that? What do we mean by tacit knowledge? So here we're saying stuff that's you know, of very little impact, of, of low importance, um, things that almost run, run of the mill. All right. And if it's based around social interaction, well, what's educational about that? Some people would say that there are better things to do if you want social interaction. Another one of the the criticisms of you know, particularly earlier coach education was the fact that, yeah, it was all about content knowledge. So, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't know your sport, there is no way that you could have a role in coaching. Um, and if you wanted to get better further up the ranks, you had to keep learning more and more about your sport or your code and the content no uh, notions and, and traditions according to that particular code. We've moved on from that obviously, but there is still a need as far as a lot of the, the folks researching coach education in particular are concerned, they're saying that, yeah, there's still a long way to go, there's still a lot of things that we don't know about. Um, and if we're going to be educators as part of our role as coaches, then we need to look very carefully about what we mean by an educator. And what do we know about your role? in terms of the way that you behave. Or even your, you know, at a micro-analytical level, even your behavior within each coaching session. So what are you doing? Are you observing? Are you managing? Are you giving feedback? And if the feedback um, is forthcoming, what sort of feedback is it? So you know, we know from a lot of the um, the systematic observation work that's done in the coaching world, there are lots of things uh, that coaches do that you know,
probably aren't very educative. And you know, in, in days gone by, particularly in the in the early 90s, when uh, a lot of the instrumentation came out for coach anal analysis systems and protocols like Kafias and what have you, uh, we learned a lot about what coaches actually do as far as their behaviour goes, and we would monitor, excuse me, we would monitor them, all right, and we can classify as far as against the clock or the number of times they do each thing, etc. Uh, and it's very quite scary. However. Uh, we still need to know a lot more about it because that's only in the coaching environment. We don't know what happens what, you know, in the pre-planning phase or the actual planning phase or you know, what happens after the session, etc. as far as you know, their wider lives are concerned. We can, we can get an idea or a picture of what coaches do as far as their behaviour is concerned in a coaching environment with their players, but beyond that we know that that's another question altogether. So, we opened the clip, um, opened the day with the clip uh, with our orchestra, all right, and Bernstein, all right, doing a bit of Beethoven. So now we're going to put you in that situation and see how you would react or what you would do and what that means. So what did you notice? Everyone in the room started. They got more out there as it went on. <laughs> yeah. They got more comfortable with it. 
what the else? The notes are all the same, you know, but they're just played a little differently. Mm -hmm. The basics are all there. Mm -hmm. There were people that had little knowledge of music in some cases, and they could step up to the job and do it. Yep. <coughs> they, they reacted to the how the conductor... There was some others. reaction, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah, there was definitely gesture there. Um, there was trust, they were willing to yep. do what they were told to do. Absolutely. And did you notice anything about the conductors? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, each and every one of them had an approach, didn't they? They had a, a way of interpreting what they think it was, it was all about, and what they thought was important. They were committed. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's a reflection of their personalities, but they allowed their personality to be part of who it was they were as conductors. And in the coaching world, are we there? So are we, are we at the point where, as coaches, you can be yourselves in terms of your personalities? Or is it something else that you become as soon as you walk into the gym or onto the field or whatever? And is that what we want? Do you know what's written on my pen right here? Creativity is part of human nature. It can only be untaught. There you go. I've never read the pen before. Isn't <laughs> <laughs> that strange? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions for you, just leading into that or leading into the next se section as far as um, the piece of paper that I've just passed around to you. Um, so, do you coach for creativity or conformity? Right. You don't have to answer that publicly, but it's just something that I want you to reflect on. Right. So we're, we're pulling out the C's today, creativity or conformity. And secondly, do you coach for curiosity or compliance? More C's. So the clip that you've just watched, for instance, was an opportunity for somebody to be creative. All right? It wasn't an opportunity for somebody to be conformative. So the orchestra were actually saying, it's all yours, brother, sister, whoever, where you go. All right? And obviously, there were people who stood up and decided that, yep, I want my, my chance to be curious about this. Wow, what would it be like to be up on that pedestal with that bat on? I'd love to have a go at that. I mean, if you'd been in the crowd, I wonder how many of you would have actually said, ooh, give me a go. You know, I want that power. I want to be able to control those buggers with the violins and oboes and what have you. But there are other people that would say, no way, not me. I'm not going to make a dick of myself up there. Um, we just don't know. But the really important thing is that something has probably controlled your decision and something has probably led you to interpret that environment uh, by the sorts of cues that you've picked up from whoever. All right? So, the, you know, the, the people around you, the people actually in the orchestra pit, etc., etc. Right? Now, I've given you a sheet of paper. All right? And on this, there's a list of 18 qualities. All right? I want you to rank your top five. Let's just look at the top five. All right? Now, let's deal with the level that you're coaching at, and obviously the players that you're dealing with. But in terms of the characters, in terms of the people, what do you think are the qualities that we're looking for, and by we I'm putting in inverted commas, that we are looking for in terms of you as a coach? What do you think is important? Next important, etc., etc.
Just the top five. No equals allowed. Need more time? Are you good? If you're happy to share, just exchange your first couple with your partner, whoever's sitting next to you. Um, and if you want to obviously give your explanation as to why you picked what you did or what you ranked, feel free to go ahead. Time's up. Yep. <laughs> Second task is I now want you to list what you would consider be your five top qualities. Your five top qualities as a coach working at this level. So out of this list? Out of this list. If there's something else, just ignore it. <coughs> I kept my meta-analysis to 18.
just make sure you can um, delineate between the two. So maybe your second one's going to have a, the ones that I've just asked you to put for your qualities, maybe put a circle around that. Time's up. Right, let's go round. So scenario one was the qualities that you think are looked for in an effective coach. Your top five. So let's just go round and have your top pick. So we'll start with Gary. Individually. Okay. No, the first the first section in terms of what you think we collectively out there are looking for in qualities. Okay. 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 So let's go to the second part, the second question, in terms of what you think is your strongest quality of those 18 there. And yes, obviously there'll be other things as well, but um, and some of you, of course, we could have written a tome about, but. Let's just let's just stick to your top one. Same. Same. Make games and practice fun. Same. I understand the coordinates. Yeah, understand the coordinates. Okay. 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 Um, okay. So how many of you had the same for both categories? All right. So, this is what the players think. So these are two samples that I've done over the years. Um, one is elite players in the Waikato representative level, um, and the sample was uh, 16 to 20. 
right. And the second one, USA, was when I was at Ohio State University working with um, college athletes who were on full paid scholarships. Uh, and that was in a variety of sports, but they were basically physical education sport majors. So I'll give you a moment or two to digest the numbers, but obviously the lower the number, the higher the ranking. And then I want you to react, given what you've shared and what you've selected, I want you to react to what you're seeing up there. And feel free to chip in from any time now. Yeah, and I mean that pyramid that you've got in front of you exemplifies the whole idea of knowing each player as individuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and it was reasonably successful. So that's yeah, probably more aligned to my coaching style, yep. the humanistic coaching style. Yep. So he was agree to it. Just speaking from the American point of view too, is that in remembering I'm 52, so I've been through the the whole American system, and it's really oh, cutthroat. You drill, 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 because you're trying to go for you know college scholarships and yep. the whole deal. So the fun and games aspect of it to a player is going to be really appealing in America because it's a lot of hard slog at an early age. It's work. It is. It's work over it's there. Like yeah. A job. Yeah. However, it's shifting here. Mm. There's no doubt about that. Mm. Yeah. Well, I yeah. suppose they're the different perceptions from an individual person basis to a coaching basis. I see the understand the quality of a good team on both sides are fairly low on the ranking because from an individual potential perspective, <coughs> they're actually not going to recognise or understand that type of Yeah, they may not have experienced that, so they don't know what it is. From a coaching perspective, yeah, absolutely. it becomes a lot, I would say, a little bit higher, certainly in team sports, yep. around that recognition. Yep. Well, yeah, but, but, you know, yeah, because I don't know from the survey exactly whether it's an individual sport or a team sport. Yep. They're involved in Other reactions? When we were um, talking about the, like, as a coach, what we looked at, we kind of had similar ones, but then we were kind of thinking about that knowledge of the sport. When we put it back on to us, when we were, when we were athletes, like, what we want, yep. and we actually wanted a coach with knowledge of the sport. Yep. It wasn't like that, it wasn't one that we initially picked as our highest. Yep. Have you noticed how far ahead the top two are from the rest? You know, they, I mean that's why they're, de they're obviously defined in a different colour. Right? So from the player's perspective there in both samples, they are significantly ahead of number three. So one and two are you know, out in front. But there's a big drop from two to three. So the message that the athletes are telling us, and remember this is only from the athlete's perspective, is that those two are considered to be primo, top-notch, things that they really do look for. That's not to say that you know there are other things that we really must pay attention to, etc., etc., and it's not to say that it would shift if we did another sample in another place at another time because it would shift, there's no doubt about that. But I think it does give us a really interesting perspective on how these things are seen from the player's perspective. And after all, that's what we're there for, isn't it? Now, the other thing I just wanted to draw your attention to is where does the art of coaching fit in a lot of those categories? Or perhaps conversely, where's the science there? Does, for instance, the science form part of number two? 
knowledge of the sport coached. It's got to both go into the mix to actually make it so a good communicator yeah. needs to know how people learn to be able to use that communication line. And if he knows what makes his own individual players tick and how they learn, it may go a long way to actually tick the big boxes for those players individually as well. Yep. But without that science, you can't then introduce the, suppose, the art of communication. Uh, to certain people. Yep. Fair call. One of the that's alarming for me is that players need to be professional and effective and good communication, yet that's a skill that I think that athletes these days are particularly poor at. So their expectation of the coach is very high in that area, even themselves, you know, um, communication and society, the way it's society. So do you mean back to the to the coach or between the players or just in general? Yeah. It's interesting to see what they define as communication too. Like do they want, just from recent experiences, do they want feedback every second of the practice session and do they want to be told what to do? Is that good communication? You know, like what, what do they define yeah. as communication? Yeah, yeah. Well, do they want to actually have a voice? So part of the communication means, you know, a good communicator is actually someone prepared to listen to the athletes or encourages the athletes to speak. So, you know, if, the, if, if our athletes, for instance, are not good communicators, is it because we're not putting them in forums whereby they get to practice and develop their communication skills? I was going to say, you just get the thumb, get the thumb out, and they'll give you the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they'll sit in the bus and text to each other rather than get into a conversation. But is that, and they want feedback, and you're saying, but the reality is, is that when you're very point blank with it, they can't handle it. Yeah. Yeah. But in that the face of a society, like via email and text, it's easier. But actually, face to face, they can't actually take it. I think if you can teach, but it's probably something more. If you can teach them to understand and take honest, front, forefront feedback at a younger age, then they will go into our realms knowing that. Mm -hmm. I think even at that high school level, we like where that whole everyone must participate. You're awesome. Like there's a real lack of their constructive feedback at a young age. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the communication that seems to be going on out there is covert, isn't it? So, you know, they've got the, they've got the net, they've got the phone, what have you, etc. And there are so many things whereby, in terms of overtly com communicating with somebody, so me having a discussion with you face to face, is actually quite unusual for a lot of people. Um, I mean, I deliberately start up conversations with students in our lift because most of them, as soon as they get in the lift, this comes out and there's six of them all in there doing this. And I'll ask a question and nobody will answer it because they all assume that it's got nothing to do with them and I'm just not trying to break into some sort of conversation. They are very, very intense on that screen. Um, and it's only seven floors. But, yeah, it's a nightmare. It's a disaster. You know what's interesting here, too, is that a lot of you guys are coaching teams where they, your participants have no choice. If they want to be on that team, you know, you're, they are the coach. Whereas with me, they, there's a lot of competition, you know, to be a riding instructor. So, for me, I'm really straight up with them. I'm saying, look, if you, if you want the real skinny on what's going on, I'm going to deliver it to you but I don't want to need tears, you know, this is just how it is. And they might not like that. They might go and find another coach to coach them for that sport. So it's really an interesting perspective on, I'm very hardcore on that line about delivery and, you know, that's it. And sometimes you do have a boo-hoo, but then, you know, you do explain why it is. And, and, and I draw on science yep. to say, hey, it's actually a mechanical thing. Take the emotion out of it.
I just wonder if it's got to do with respect. With respect? Yes, yeah, and trust. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of unans unanswered questions, aren't there? Yeah, and I thought that that might say good communicator, okay, yeah, knowledge of the sport. So you build a respect within the, within the person and the athlete and the coach. It's something like that. Some of them knew that sort of it's around respect. Yep, yep. But if you think back to some of the things that we had earlier on in the slides, particularly about you know the um, the art, if you remember the slide from Wheatson of that book, and he talked about the art of engagement, the art of communication, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. and you talk about some of those categories that he had about motivating players, you know, to achieve common and individual goals. There they are, they're up there. So in a lot of ways it does tie up with you know, some of the things that he was referring to in that, in this case it's the AFL season. But it's an interesting exercise to go through, if nothing else for just a reflective process on yourselves. We've got one slide to go. Could I just, just on that Back. Where the, is that a cultural thing where make games practices and fun is completely different in one country to the other in, yeah. the, in their recognition? Yeah. Absolutely. And part of that was to do with the whole notion of how serious sport is in the US. So for instance, high school sport, basketball, two teams, school of nearly 2,000. Right? So you've got your freshman team and your varsity team. And you've got a squad of 10 or 12. That's it. There's no other, there's no other basketball. You, know, you want to do anything else, you get out on the blacktop down at the community centre on the, you know, and, and you ball. You go balling. So, you know, for them, there's a hell of a lot at stake. Um, whereas in New Zealand, you know, a lot of your high schools will have 20, 30, even 40-odd basketball teams. So and it's like, clubs and yeah, just, just make it fun. Yeah. Okay, let's finish off with some climate change. Thought I'd finish up with something topical. <coughs> Seeing that it's on everybody's lips and we've just uh, had the politicians talking about it somewhere in the world. One of the things that we've got to try and do as coaches, irrespective of our environment, is create the right climate. All right. Now, if we just think about answering some of these things or acknowledging some of these things in terms of, right, is there an art to that? Is there an art to that? Um, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by asking that question overtly. Right. So, let's create the right, uh, the right environment or the right climate. And that means, obviously, given the fact that we've been looking at decision making today, particularly as far as naturalistic decision making is concerned, we have to apply or seek some sort of climate control. All right. So wherever possible, yes, as the coach, you are charged with being in charge. That is your role, and that's the way it should be. But there's a lot of other things that we obviously have to factor in. So for you to actually control the environment and have control uh, in the way that you want it to be, you have to make some decisions. But in essence, the decisions are pretty much based on your view of the world. And as we've seen today, uh, that can be dependent on a whole lot of things, uh, particularly in terms of what you consider to be important. But above all else, it's your decisions that are going to control the environment that you end up running or your athletes end up experiencing. Okay? So the question is, as sort of you know, a take-home message, etc., is how do you create the right sort of conditions for your climate? Now we've talked about culture a lot today, as far as you know, sports cultures and team cultures, etc., are concerned. But we also have to talk about this notion of conditions. You know, what are the right conditions, day to day, session to session, you know, season by season? Because obviously the team or the group that you've got now will be totally different to the group that you're going to have next year. Uh, and that means that you are going to have to change the conditions. You're going to have to be able to read those, change those, adapt them, modify them, etc. And the question is, is that an art, being able to do that? Have you got the prerequisites? And does that mean things like considering this whole notion of learning and authenticity right. and pedagogy? 
right. the way that you're going to deliver things across. Not necessarily what it is that you're delivering, but how you're going to get it across. All right. The style that you choose to offer these people. And is it going to be some form of authentic learning, i.e., if you've got a, a sporting situation, are you going to spend most of your time, like I've done with you today, talking about it on the board or having it up on the screen and showing video clips and doing stats and what have you, or are we actually going to put people into authentic settings where they can learn these things uh, that are crucial to our respective sports? And then finally, deep within you are all sorts of artistic qualities. Some of them you've found and some of them you probably haven't. Uh, and the question is, do you actually create the right conditions and the right sort of climate in your coaching worlds to be able to extract or unearth or reveal uh, your artistic capacities? Because a lot of people out there appreciate art. Right. And they appreciate the artistic, the capital A. So do they actually get the chance to appreciate your artistry as a coach by the way you arrange your conditions or the climate that you set in whatever environment is that you're in? I'm going back to the quote. So that was Forrest Gump saying that's all I've got to say about that. Thank you very much.